Our final uh, talk of today uh, is from the um, Chief Executive Officer of Campbell, Howard White, um, and Founding Executive Director of the International Initiative for Impact Evaluation, otherwise known as 3IE. And before that, Howard led the impact evaluation or the programme of the World Bank's Independent Evaluation Group. And Howard's own work has a focus on policy relevance of our work, including incorporating academic rigour into the development of policy and practice. So we're delighted to have you, Howard. Thank you for being here. Okay, thank you, Sarah. It's a great pleasure to be here <coughs> at the launch of the first um, Campbell National Regional Centre. So my talk will repeat some of what has been said about why doing reviews is important and the bulk of the talk will dwell on some principles for evidence-based policy and practice based on the experience of different groups around the world trying to use review evidence um, to inform policy. So I'll start with an example um, of why systematic reviews are important one that people have heard me speak before will have heard me mention. This is a story in the BBC from a few years ago, um, 2014. In many countries around the world, including the UK, government recommended advice is to eat five fresh pieces of fruit and vegetables a day. A study came out in 2014, reported on the BBC, saying, well, actually, that advice was wrong, and that actually there were health benefits, reduction in mortality, so not like just, oh, you feel better, you actually don't die if you eat more than, seven piece, more than five pieces of fruit and vegetables a day, actually seven or more pieces of fruit and vegetables a day are better for you than the just five. The government recommendation is wrong, you'll actually live longer by eating seven or pieces or more a day. A couple of months later, the BBC ran another story which said that actually having more than five a day has no effect. So, very clearly, two stories coming from the BBC which have directly contradictory findings. And this is a problem. Why do people, the general public, not use evidence? Because scientists can't agree. We tell you, coffee's good for you, coffee's bad for you, eat red meat, don't eat red meat, exercise more, exercise less, eat five pieces of fruit vegetables a day, or eat more than five pieces of fruit and vegetables a day. If you're getting these contradictory messages coming from the scientific community, then why are you going to trust the next piece of evidence you read when you think it's going to be contradicted the, the following day or the following week or the following month? Well, let's look at the underlying evidence and see which of these is right. And we can answer that question. Here's the data from the seven-piece study. It has a nice graph. It's published in a peer-reviewed journal. And they have a reference category of zero. People have never seen a fruit or vegetable in their life. I don't know what it looks like. Yes. And, um, and the more fruit and vegetables that you eat, up to seven or more, then there's percentage reduction in the probability of dying. So again, this is really quite an important outcome. You're 42% less likely to die if you eat seven or more pieces of fruit and vegetables a day than some that never eats any. So it sounds like that's a great thing to do. The problem here is these are is correlational analysis of observational data. That means that they're using data that records people's dietary habits, it records their longevity, and simply observes a correlation between those two things. There's massive selection bias here. What do we know about people that eat seven or more pieces of fruit and vegetables a day? They're not normal, okay? This is not normal behavior. Okay, these people spend the whole time eating fruit and vegetables and going to the gym, and that's all they do. Right? So, I'm more seriously, these, these people are very health conscious, they're more likely to be wealthy, better educated and so on, and all of these are correlates of living longer, longevity. So, sure, there's a relationship between eating more fruit and vegetables and living longer, but what direction the causation goes, we cannot tell from these data. So the story here should have been shock horror, bad research funded and published. That's the story here. Low quality research gets published, what a shock. The, the five piece study also has a nice diagram showing in this case a hazard, ra hazard ratio where we see the probability of dying, yet again, same outcome variable, declines as you eat more fruit and vegetables, but it plateaus at five. 
So once you eat more than five pieces of fruit and vegetables a day, you might get flatulence, but you won't get any fitter and, and live longer. So what are these data? This is a systematic review of seven, 16 high quality studies. Observational data, because RCT is not available for dietary practices, but they do analysis, only include analysis, which controls for some way of, for the confounders of health and, sorry, of education, health practices, health awareness, and so on. So only high quality studies are being included. So we can put much more faith in the five piece study. It's high quality research, it's a systematic review, than we can the seven piece study, correlation analysis of observational data. So apparently contradictory findings can be explained away and we can say which of this piece of evidence we should trust and which one we shouldn't. So if you can't, yeah, if you can't trust the BBC, who can you trust? And the hint is systematic reviews at the top of the evidence pyramid and that's what Campbell does. Here's one example of the evidence pyramid where we have different types of evidence. This, uh, Julia showed a different variation of this. And systematic reviews come at the top of it. So what we really want to be using is systematic review evidence wherever we can. And there is a growing movement. Um, sorry, just, sorry. So it matters because they matter because correlation is not causation. And systematic reviews only include high quality evidence of effects which controls for some way for selection bias by using randomised control trials, experimental designs, natural experiments that are available, or non-experimental designs like regression discontinuity that do take account of selection bias. And the Campbell Library is a, is a global repository of this knowledge that we have globally of what works and, and what doesn't and, and why and so on. Now, there is a... Um, a growing body of evidence, uh, bodies using, using evidence around the world. So we have particularly in the UK the What Works Centres like Education and Down Foundation, Centre for Aging Better, um, what, work, what Works Centre for Wellbeing and so on. In the Nordic countries you have government funded research centres which do systematic reviews on a sort of demand room basis for government departments. You have uh, in the US the What Works Clearinghouse in Education that we heard about. There are also clearinghouses in Labour and and in justice and in child welfare. So you have this growing number of agencies that are producing reviews. And I'll talk a bit, I'll mention some of them as I go on during this talk. What I'm going to talk about here is having looked at what these different agencies are doing and how they're working, can we identify some general principles for evidence-informed policy and practice? And I'm going to talk about eight principles. The first one is we've, we've heard about already. And the example I will use about is mandatory arrest for domestic violence. So um, some 30, over 30 years ago now, there was a trial in Minneapolis that showed that when you have mandatory arrest, that means when the police are called to uh, a domestic abuse incident, they have to arrest the perpetrator. That's mandatory arrest. In the Minneapolis trial, the police were given a randomization device and told when you're called to, a, called to a domestic abuse scene, you randomly assign that case to one of three treatments. One is mandatory arrest, one is counselling the couple, and the other is remo temporarily removing the perpetrator from the scene. And the Minneapolis, Minneapolis study showed that re-abuse rate um, when there's mandatory arrest, mandatory arrest was only 13%, half of that compared to simple removal from the home. So a comparatively large effect. This study was widely cited, it was mentioned in the New York Times and so on, and by 20 years later, by the early 2000s, over three quarters of the police forces around the US had mandatory arrest policies, based on the evidence from the Minneapolis study. The problem is that five other large-scale trials in other cities around the US failed to replicate that finding. They found that mandatory arrest was no better than other other approaches are actually less beneficial than the other approaches. And the authors in the Minneapolis study themselves said, we don't think our study was sufficient evidence on which to base a scaling up of this policy. And clearly the evidence there, the, the, sort of the principle there is don't rely on single studies. This we've heard again and again and again, don't rely on single studies. Why should we not rely on single studies? Because context matters. 
the transferability of evidence from one setting to another is limited by the context in which that intervention takes place. Here's a very clear example of this. This is the Nurse Family Partnership Programme. Nurse Family Partnership is an example of what's called a branded programme. Branded programmes grew very rapidly in the United States. They're coming, they've come to our shores, they're spreading across Europe, they're spreading across Australia, and New Zealand is an example. These are programmes in which an, a, an academic group invents, invents an approach and, brand, and, and patents it, and agencies using that approach have to pay a licence fee and get training at a cost from the inventors of the programme. Commonly, those programmes get evaluated, they're called evidence-based programmes, they get evaluated by the designers of the programme, they find that they work, so they persuade some other states to adopt their programme based on it worked, and they do two or three studies showing that their programme works, then they do a re so-called review of their own studies of their own programme and find that it works. There's a possible conflict of interest here that apparently has gone unnoticed. Um, Actually, the Canberra Review's show demonstrate this conflict of interest quite clearly, that non-independent evaluations are much more likely to find an effect than our independent evaluations of those same programmes. So, Nurse Family Partnership is a, um, a as the name suggests, a nursing programme for mothers, pregnant and young mothers from disadvantaged backgrounds, to give them fairly intensive health visits during the early months of a child's life to improve um, the child development and the child well-being for, young, for newborns, young babies. And Nurse Family Partnership has been adopted here in the UK, in the Netherlands, and in this case from Australia. And if you go to the Australian website, you'll find them saying, this is an evidence-based programme, here's the evidence from three trials conducted in the United States in the 70s, 80s and 90s by the designers of the programme, which they don't mention here, but that's who carried out these three studies. So here's the evidence based between nurse family partnership. What they don't mention is a more recent study of, NF, of NFP here in the UK, published in The Lancet, and that study in The Lancet says that actually there's no additional short-term benefits from nurse family partnership on the primary outcomes. We don't yet have the data on the long-run outcomes, so we can perhaps say um, that we should proceed with caution, but programme continuation is not justified based on current evidence. Now, why is this? This actually is a common example of the lack of transferability of branded programmes from the US to Europe, particularly the UK. Because what's the programme? The programme gives health visits to mothers giving, disadvantaged mothers giving, giving birth. In the UK, you have free antenatal care, you have free delivery in hospital, you get a Perth package and a health visitor will come to your home on at least a weekly basis until he or she thinks it's no longer necessary. That is nurse family partnership. So how on earth is nurse family partnership going to make any difference to the standard treatment of care when the standard treatment of care is the same as nurse family partnership? It's not. And so it's not surprising that the evaluation of the programme in the UK finds no difference because the control group is different to what it is in the US where disadvantaged families fall out of the health outside the health insurance system and do not get that support. So programmes are not transferable because context matters. You can't simply take findings from one situation and transfer them to another situation. That shows very clearly why evidence-based policy cannot be a blueprint approach. As Paul said, you can't take a program that works in New York and try it in Belfast, because the context will be different. What evidence-based policy means is when you want to start a new program or try a new program, look at the global evidence base. For God's sake, why would you start a new program without looking at existing evidence from elsewhere? If, if you're going to have an operation or a child's going to have an operation, you don't say, Sure, stick in the knife, let's see what happens. You say, well, you know, has this operation been done before? How did it go? What sort of people? Are there side effects? And so on. You want to know what the evidence is. Exactly the same when you want to do uh, a new programme. But you want to say, well, of the different approaches that's worked elsewhere, which seem most applicable here? Let's try them out and test them here. So an example of this, um, actually, so we heard an example from Peter where hotspot policing appears to work, 
a number of Latin American countries and, and Caribbean countries, including Trinidad, have said, OK, let's do randomised control trials, hotspot policing here to see if it works here. Uh, the example I've got here is the Norwegian Knowledge Centre for Education. The minister said that he is interested in trying to reduce dropouts, so children dropping out from school. And there's a Canberra review on that. It's a bit old. So the Knowledge Centre updated the Canberra review and they said there's actually half a dozen things that seem to be effective. Let's take two of those that seem applicable in the Norwegian context, that seem like they make sense in our setting, and now let's try them out with RCTs in Norway. And that's currently ongoing. So it's not, oh, it worked in the US, let's do it here in Oslo. It's, it worked there, let's try out those programmes here. It's not a blueprint approach. And when you're doing this, looking at resisting evidence base, of course you must look at the evidence base from high quality reviews. So the, um, don't use low quality, what do is called haphazard reviews, NASH reviews, count, vote counting reviews. So here we have the logo of the Cochrane Collaboration, our, our partner um, organisation working in health. And this is their logo, which is a stylized representation of a forest plot for corticoid steroid injections given to women about to deliver prematurely. Premature babies are much more likely to die than those born at full term. And the point of giving the injection is to reduce the risk of premature death of those infants. And so in this forest plot, the vertical line is the line of no effect, as usual. If the line lies entirely to the left, then there's a reduction in the probability of death. And if it crosses the vertical line, then the injection has no effect. And so as Paul explained, each horizontal line is a study. And we have seven studies, five finding no difference, but two showing that actually giving injection reduces the risk of death. But the key thing to look at is the diamond at the bottom, the meta-analysed average effect size, which shows there's a um, 30 to 50 percent reduction in mortality as a result of this injection. Now, if we were vote counters, we would say, eh, the evidence is mixed. We're not sure. There have been seven studies, five have found no effect. Two have found effect, sure, but five found no effect. So on balance, we'd say the evidence says it doesn't work. We'd be wrong, we'd be literally killing babies if we used vote counting rather than actually did meta-analysis, which is the correct way to synthesise this evidence. And the fact that Cochrane came along and said we can use meta-analysis to overcome the possible underpowering of those studies meant that we had an accurate summary of these data has led to this intervention being adopted widely around the world and saved literally hundreds of thousands of lives that would have been lost had we relied on old-fashioned, incorrect vote counting approaches. So make, doing high quality studies really, really matters. Um, Non-systematic reviews are, example, are biased. Here's actually an example that Julia mentioned based on her own work. Um, so she mentioned her review of multi systemic therapy. This is based on a paper she's written on that. Um, here's a study, one study of multi systemic therapy, a small randomised controlled trial of 43 families in which they're, they're randomly allocated either to MST or, or parent training as your alternative treatment arm. So you're comparing MST with parent training, which is more than like standard treatment of care. It's a lower cost group-based intervention rather than the more intensive family-based intervention of MST. This is a study undertaken by um, designers of the programme, one of the early studies of MST. In there, in the, and I'm talking about this one paper here. So this one paper by Brun Katow looked at 30 outcomes. And of those, five favoured MST over parent training, two favoured parent training of MST on different outcome measures, and 22 of the 30 outcomes found no difference. And one outcome wasn't reported, we don't know what, what they found. But 22 said no difference. In the... Um, ab in, oh, let's just go to that. There are actually 14 non systematic reviews, haphazard reviews that Julia looked at in looking at how they report this paper, and of those 14, nine report just one outcome of this paper. This paper has 30 outcomes, which 22 says no difference, but nine reviews just report one outcome of this paper saying, oh, MST is better. So that's selective outcome reporting in practice. People are going in there with priors, with biases, plucking out, cherry-picking the finding that supports what they believe. 
In systematic reviews, you cannot do that. In systematic review, you have to report, you have to record and report all outcomes that you said you're going to look at in your protocol. So there are over 100 now reviews in this literature more generally saying MST is better than parent training. But the review that, that Julia did showed on a whole range of policy domains around family cohesion, out of home placement, delinquency and so on, MST is no different, no superior to standard parent training. So NAT reviews are biased, finding MST is better, actually a high quality NAT review, so it is no better than um, on sorry, those, those, those outcome variables. Second example is payment for environmental, environmental services, my own background in international development. So this is where you pay farmers not to cut down trees, basically. So we like forests, please don't cut them down, we'll pay you. And here's the forest plot, and we look at the, um, the top diamond, the dark, the darker one. When you've got a heterogeneity, use what's called a random effects model, and that's the top diamond here, which does show a significant effect based on five studies, but it's a very small effect. The, the measurement here is something called an SMD, a standard mean deviation, and uh, no, sorry, that's standard mean difference. And we call a small SMD around 0.2, and this MD is less than 0.05. It's, it's tiny, okay? It's significant, but it's tiny. The size of the effect matters. And what that means when we convert it to a meaningful metric is, SF, that, is that the payment receives a 0.03% deforestation rate. It averts 0.3% deforestation. That means if you pay farmers for 10 years not to cut down trees, after 10 years, 97% of those payments being, being made to not cut down trees, they would not have been cut down in the absence of their payments. 97% of, of those trees would still be standing if you had never gone there and paid any farmer any money whatsoever. So this is not a very cost-effective intervention. And we have qualitative data included in the review, it's the Campbell Review, in the review that support that finding also. I presented these findings in, in Norway, where they, they like forests a lot and they actually paid for this review. And they said, but there's another recent review done by the Swedish agency EBA that says that pests are effective, they work. And so again, they said, what are we to think? You've got one review saying they don't work, another review saying they do work. As a policymaker, what should we think? We'll just keep doing what we're doing because you can't make up your mind. So I looked at the EBA review, and they say, well, we looked at 11 studies, and more than half of which judged pests to be successful. So what have they done wrong? They'd done vote counting. They had said there, there, there are 11 studies, half of them say it's successful. That's vote counting. So they haven't looked at the effect sizes. Because actually we in the Canberra Review don't say it doesn't work, we say it works, just the effect size is tiny. But they can't tell that because they don't look at the effect size, because in vote counting you don't look at the effect size, with the variation of that effect size, give more weight to higher quality, more precise studies, so I don't do any of that. Um, and also, as we only had five studies in their review, they have 11. Did they do a better search? No, they, no, they didn't do a better search. They simply lowered the quality threshold. What they called themselves generous screening criteria. They wanted to include lower quality studies so they could have more studies. There's a well-established inverse relationship between the quality of studies and the probability of finding an effect. So the lower the quality of a study, and the many camera reviews show this, so the lower the quality of a study, the more likely to find an effect. So lowering the quality threshold makes it more likely they're going to find an effect. So this review is simply misleading. We should not take notice of this reviewing saying they judge pests to be successful. We should look at the camera review that says, yes, there's an effect, but actually it's very small. It's not cost effective. So this problem, and it's a real problem, of the proliferation of low quality reviews is uh, a problem for Campbell, it's a problem for policymakers, for practitioners, and there is an answer. Register your reviews with Campbell or Cochrane. It's very straightforward. It sounds self-interested, it is a bit self-interested, but I've, I've you know, come to believe in the few years I've now been involved in Campbell, um, it's just, what, four years ago in Belfast, I was coerced into becoming co-chair before I became CEO, um, no, three years only, that uh, this, this really is the truth. This really is the way, the way to go. 
So, as the example of PEST shows, you need to focus on cost effectiveness, on effect size, not statistical significance. It's a shortcoming in many reviews, including still some Cambridge reviews. It's a problem academics. They're, they're, they like to stare at the stars, they fix the little stars of how statistical significant it is. That's what they're, they're fixated on, whereas actually it's the, it's the effect size, in particular the cost effectiveness of achieving that effect, that, that really matters. And the problem is cost effect analysis is not normally included in the primary studies. It's not included in many of the reviews. To date, we're trying to change that. <coughs> Number six, though, is to, is to dig down a bit more, to dig down to answer more questions about not just does it work, but why does it work, in what context and who. So you need to dig down, answer what I call second generation questions. So the first generation question is does it work? And second generation questions are, well, what designs work better? What are the key aspects of implementation, implementation and so on? So I have a couple of examples of this. Um, conditional cash transfers, these are programs that give cash transfers to poor families in developing countries in return for certain behaviours, normally ch sending children to school. And what we know from a lot, a lot of studies, including randomised controlled trials, of conditional cash transfers. And we know that actually having conditions matters and the better monitored and enforced those conditions are, then the more likely there has been impact. Children living in communities with conditional cash transfer programs that are well monitored and enforced are 60% more likely to go to school than children living in communities with cash transfers with no conditions. So conditions make a big difference. We know that you can, that I need to, okay, what sort, you can look at what sort of conditions you, you want to have. You can say who to give the money to, does it go for older children to the child themselves, primary caregiver, head of household and so on, or how to give the money, which actually is a big challenge in remote communities where there's no banking facilities. Uh, problems being overcome now by, by um, virtual money, SMS money and so on. Um, and then when and how often to give the money. The, the less frequent the payment, actually uh, the, the larger the effect compared to a regular payment. Um, I got missed a slide. What, the, the, what you see here is that when you've got a lot of studies, you can actually learn quite a lot about how to design programs better. And that relies on there being heterogeneity in the data, as we saw in, in Paul's plot, a lot of heterogeneity, a lot of variation in the effect size. But actually, heterogeneity is the friend of meta-analysis, not its enemy. Because meta-analysis is not about just saying, oh, here's the average effect size. It's about explaining the variation in the effects. If there's no variation, there's nothing to explain. But okay, the thing does work or it doesn't, seemingly everywhere. That's also an important message. But normally there'll be some variation. And one of my, my favorite examples of this is not in our field at all. It's um, from the field of business. The largest growth in RCTs in, in the last two decades is nothing to do with education or health. It's the private sector. Google, Microsoft, Apple, and so on, they run literally thousands of RCTs a year. Every time you're exposed to a dozen RCTs a day and you don't know it, through mailings, direct mailings, emails, every time you go into a supermarket, you're being exposed to an RCT. And this is what the private sector is doing. Um, and so Cisco, the software company, they tripled their profits over a five, six year period by an aggressive program of mergers and acquisitions. This is surprising because what the data show is 80%, 80% of mergers and acquisitions are bad for the bottom line. Both the acquiring company and the company being acquired lose profits, lose money as a result of the merger and acquisition process. So how come did Cisco expand successfully on the basis of merger and acquisitions? They said 80% fail, that means 20% work. Let's look at the characteristics of 20% of work, that work and let's do those. But they had a database of 9,000 mergers and acquisitions to look at in doing that analysis. Most systematic reviews have and Paul gave an example of maybe 20 odd uh, included studies. That's a lot. A lot of reviews have 10 or fewer included studies. You can't do much analysis of heterogeneity when that's all you've got. So it comes back to what Terry was saying in her talk. We just need more and better studies to be done to power doing more and better systematic reviews. What we do find from this one, the, the top finding about conditions and monitoring enforcement conditions, another review we have on supplementary feeding, is that implementation matters a great deal. It's not surprising, but few, too few reviews to date capture the key aspects of implementation, both on seeing how implementation matters, 
but also using the qualitative analysis and the qualitative synthesis to explain what aspects of implementation matter and so we can inform better program design, better programs that have more effects in improving lives. Point number seven, and Terry mentioned this as well, is making evidence accessible in accessible formats. So this is the earliest toolkit of the Education Endowment Foundation. They also have a teacher and learning toolkit. And this is, these toolkits are based on systematic reviews of reviews produced for the for EEF. What's nice about this is it's just so nice, okay? And this is an extremely accessible way of presenting the evidence. So you have on the far right-hand side, the, the circle of the plus sign is the impact which is the month's additional development, or in the case of the, the uh, teaching and learning toolkit, the month's additional learning the child gets as a result of that intervention. So a very clear, understandable metric of is there a big impact or not. Six is a big number, it goes down to zero where there's no impact. Then it tells you in the little locks how, how good the evidence is. So four locks, the top one, is good, strong evidence. Uh, lower down, you've got two locks, it's not such strong evidence. And then you've got how much it costs, from one pound up to five pounds. Not literally one pound or five pounds, but five pounds is a lot of money, one pound is not so much money. So the first intervention, communication language approaches, cheap intervention, good evidence, strong impact. So if you're a school manager, if you're, uh, you've got, you want to decide what approaches to adopt, you can look at the toolkit, see what's in the effective evidence-based programs, and you can click on it and go down, drill down and learn more about the program and how, what it looks like and so on through the toolkit. There was a study from NAO, National Audit Office, a couple of years or so ago, that showed the, the teaching and learning toolkit in 2013 was being used by just under a third, 31%, of school managers and by 2015 was being used by nearly two-thirds, 66% of school managers. So two things there, doubling of use over a two-year period, and 66% of your intended users are using the thing. That's enormous. That really is enormous. And what's driving that, what we, we believe, uh, in part, is the fact that you have decentralised decision-making at the school level, basically. So there's something called the pupil premium, which is a capitation grant to schools based on the number of poor students in the school, disadvantaged students that are getting school dinners um, in the school, and it, the school manager is told, use that money as you wish, but in a way that's going to improve learning outcomes to disadvantaged students. So I've got some money to spend, up to me how to use it, but it should be an evidence-based way that improves learning outcomes. How am I going to find that out? Teach and learning toolkit which is not what I'm showing. So, it's, so you've got this sort of perfect storm going on of decentralised decision making, creating a demand for evidence and supply of evidence in a very accessible way, meaning that you get this extremely high uptake. So, but if, if EF had said, oh, we've done some reviews, go to our, web, go to our website and read the reviews, it wouldn't have happened. Systematic reviews, including camera reviews, are extremely unreadable, boring documents. And when I first got involved, I thought I'm going to change that. And I decided not only was it very hard, but actually it's not the point. The point is we need to do policy-friendly derivative products, we call them, like the plain language summaries. But actually, best of all, is evidence portals like this. So the evidence databases, where you can go find the evidence, like the Campbell Library. But then there are evidence portals where that knowledge has been broken, it's been translated to use by the intended end users. And where we're serious, we've got to do this in a high quality way. There's actually a growing proliferation of evidence portals, but most of them are nearer to databases and portals, so they're not sufficiently brokered, not been enough curating of the evidence. So the best practice ones like this, and what the clearinghouses will clean up their act a bit in the last year, um, are, are really put in a, in a very policy friendly way. This gets stuck on. There we go. So in summary, what we want to move towards is an evidence-based policy practice cycle based on the clinical approach. And we've heard a lot of this does come from what's been done in medicine. It looks something like this. So you have different stages of trials in medicine. And I think we should be seeing the same in social policy. The first is, in, in, so in um, clinical trials, you have human sub subject testing. We have volunteers, often prisoners, who agree to take a drug and see if they have adverse side effects. Um, I think in 
in social policy, you want to have formative research and evaluation, you're testing out things to see if they work. Um, there's two aspects to work there. One is whether if you've, got, if you've got technology of some sort or other, if actually does actually, does actually work. Um, but also whether there's sufficient take-up to make it worthwhile. There are many interventions where there's just not the demand for them amongst the intended uh, beneficiary population. So that's a formative testing to test it under some field conditions. Then we go to efficacy trials, which is a small-scale trial, preferably using randomised control trial design, where you're doing it according to protocol. You're doing it like it's meant to be implemented. And you see if you get the desired effects. If that's true, then you take it to scale, doing it under true field conditions, being implemented by the agency that's going to implement the programmes, it goes, gets rolled out to see if it still works. Because there are many, many cases where effects that have been observed in e at efficacy trials do not get observed once you go to scale, most likely because of implementation fidelity. It might be because of changing population characteristics, but most likely implementation. Once it's proven to work at scale, you keep doing trials because you try in different contexts, you try to, uh, different subpopulations, and you start introducing A-B testing around different designs, different ways of implementing the programme, and so on to keep learning. And all of that gets rolled up into high quality evidence synthesis, which feeds back in to designing new programmes, both for yourself and for others around the world. So you get this evidence-driven policy practice cycle Every stage of which, of course, is an initiative process because you might find form testing doesn't work, try something else, pilot program doesn't work, try something else. And every stage, like snakes and ladders, you might have to go back to the go to start because it fails at that stage, you need to go back and try again. And the key thing I want to emphasize here is because we have seen uh, and Paul mentioned a bit with the growth of randomised controlled trials, we have seen particularly the green circle becoming particularly important, it's so like efficacy trials. It remains the case in, in social policy, but it's also true in medicine, that people do efficacy trials and actually don't then do the effectiveness when it goes to scale. And that really matters, because things that worked at pilot stage often don't work at scale. There are many studies showing that. And, but also keep testing as you roll out new populations, new contexts and so on. So this test, 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 just keep testing, just keep testing is very important. And we're seeing that. What we're not seeing on sufficient scale, what I call the third wave of the evidence revolution, is actually just consulting the global evidence base when you start thinking about new programmes or programme redesign. And it's so obvious and fundamental, as, well, as I said earlier, why don't we consult global evidence like we would when we're going to do an important operation for ourselves, we'd ask, well, what does it work? Do we know it works? How do we know it works? If you're going to spend millions of dollars, millions of pounds, billions of pounds on new programs, look at the evidence elsewhere, think what to try, and then test it in your context. That's the evidence-based policy cycle. So the principle eight is you can make a difference if you do this. If you don't do this, you'll make a difference. You'll, you'll spend lots of money that could have been spent well and spend it badly instead. So you're making a difference is a bad difference. But if you actually believe in evidence-based policy and practice and help put into place this evidence-based policy cycle and practice cycle, you really will make a difference. We, I, I believe in 30 to 40 years from now, this will just be standard. They'll look back and say, why, why didn't that happen? Why did it take so long to get where we are today? But we're not now where we're going to be in 30, 40 years' time, and we need to build on initiatives like the new UK Nine Centre for Campbell to really promote this rigorous evidence so that we do make a difference, and that's what we're here for. So please, let's do it. Thank you. And sign up for our newsletter.